When the planet was deleted from the records of the Galactic Co-Prosperity Sphere, it no longer showed up on navigational charts, travel destinations, tax records, or any other medium that would indicate that it was still there. Except one. The planet still existed. The planet has been declared a dead zone by the GCPS, but the city still existed, the resources were still there to be claimed, and maybe even survivors, if they weren't already infested by the plague. Dead Zone is a skirmish game that details the conflict over these worlds, and today we're going to take a look at it on Gaming with ADHD. So, welcome to the first episode of Miniature Monday. Uh, we're looking at Dead Zone from Mantic Games. The second edition of this game was released in 2016. They have since had three supplements, Infestation, Outbreak, and Escalation. Each of these expansions has helped to uh, update the rules with errata, um, adding additional rules, additional scenario types, and updating the points and stats for all of the different units in the game in addition to adding additional units or even new factions. Uh, Dead Zone is part of the Warpath universe from Mantic. The other games include Dreadball, which is a futuristic sports game uh, similar to lacrosse and basketball. Uh, Warpath Firefight, which takes the same factions from Dead Zone and scales them up for larger games, uh, adds in vehicles uh, such as flyers, tanks, uh, you know, trucks, things like that. And then finally, Warpath itself, which is an even larger scale game uh, that actually puts uh, units into groups so that they, they move as sort of larger blocks of models instead of just, uh, instead of just the individual units. Now, there are the games are similar in scale to uh, Warhammer 40,000 Kill Team or Infinity and use uh, approximately 6 to 12 models per side. There are 10 unique factions from the Asterians and their mechanical armies, the Forge Fathers with their advanced equipment, to the heavily armored Enforcers. It is played on a very small footprint. Typically, a two foot by two foot play mat is used. Uh, there are rules for larger games going up to a four foot by four foot game, but the average game is played on the two by two mat. Uh, it uses a grid system for movement uh, and range. It also uses uh, exploding D8, so eight sided dice. Uh, uses alternating activations where each player will move one model at a time and that model may take either two short or one long action. And they also use a system of command dice to add in uh, tactical advantages to the different sides and we'll get into more of that later. The first thing I did want to talk about was the grid system. Uh, Dead Zone uses a system of cubes. Uh, I call it a grid just because it's easier to, uh, to talk about it that way. Um, all speed values and, and range values are measured in cubes. So if a weapon has a range of eight, that means it can shoot eight cubes away. Uh, the distance is to its target is measured in cubes. Basically, you would count the number of cubes horizontally and the number of cubes vertically and whichever of the two numbers is larger uh, that is the range to the target uh, and a model whenever it is moving <clears throat> can move to any adjacent cube either horizontally vertically or diagonally and then finally each cube can hold a total of four size value in models. <clears throat> and we'll get into that in just a moment about what that means. I did want to take a moment and uh, and show off the a little bit more about the grid system. So as you can see here, we have a model and it is located <clears throat> in this particular cube. And to execute a move action, he can move one cube in any direction. 
Now, clearly he could not move through these solid walls. But the game makes the assumption that there are climbing handholds and that these are professionally trained soldiers and so they will be able to scale walls to get to locations that they need to be. So this cube, because it is uh, adjacent diagonally to the cube that this model is in, he can easily move up and into this space. He could also move down towards uh, or directly out of the cube into another cube. Now, when moving, you're allowed to place your model anywhere within the cube. He doesn't need to go to a specific location. So it does let you take advantage of features that happen to be in the cube that he's moving into. So over here on this side, we have this, uh, this little support. You can move so that your model is uh, behind the support and trying to take advantage of cover. Uh, if there were crates or other items within the cube, uh, you could place your model behind those. Uh, so it does give you a lot of flexibility because the only thing you're worried about is um, whether or not you are moving into the cube. Uh, you do also have the option of moving within the cube um, and as part of your movement. Uh, so this is a typical stat block. Um, this is actually one of the leaders for the Enforcer faction. Uh, so there's a couple of extra things that you would find on this stat block that you would not find on uh, on a regular trooper model, but it still serves the point to, to describe what's available here. So the unit stats are all located right underneath the unit name, and essentially there are six stats that each model has. The first stat is its move stat. It's represented by two numbers. The first number is its move value, which is used for short actions. The second number is used for a sprint action, which is a long action. Uh, the next value down is the armor value. This is used to cancel successes when determining damage taken in combat. And then below that, we have the size of the model. So as we can see, the peace cap Peacekeeper Captain here is a size 2 model. And as I said previously, each cube can contain four size worth of models. So you could have two Peacekeeper Captain, a Captain, and two Troopers. So depends on the particular model. Next statistic here is the shoot value. In this case, the Peacekeeper Captain has a 4 plus shooting value. So what this means is that any time he is making a shooting action, he will roll f for 4 or higher on the dice. Now this statistic never changes. Uh, the, the way that dice work in Dead Zone, if there are ever bonuses or penalties, you will be adding dice. You will never be changing the value of the dice that you need to roll. So the Peacekeeper Captain, when shooting, would always roll for a 4 or higher. Same goes for its fight value. In this case, he has a fight value of 5+. Plus, and this is used when he goes into melee combat or when he is defending melee combat. Uh, the third value here is the save value. And whenever he takes hits from enemy models... This is the number to determine whether or not his armor protects him or whether he's able to ignore the pain, you know, however you want to interpret it. Um, now, one thing I did mention is that uh, the fighting, uh, the model always has the option that instead of trying to make a save in a fight, he can try to fight back instead, and that allows him to try and eliminate the model on the enemy turn. So it's a nice little uh, option that you have there. Now, as I said at the beginning, the game does come with 10 factions. And we'll take a look at those really quick. Well, most of them. Uh, the first one we have here is the Enforcers. They're a human faction. They have One of their features is heavy armor and good shooting ability. Uh, overall, they're a very 
uh, they're sort of the elites of of the human factions. Our next one is the Asterians here in the middle. They effectively they're a space elf type of army. Um, they are actually mostly a robotic army. You will have some units, some elite units that are are actual living uh, living models. But most of them you will see are these marionettes or ciphers that are, uh, or drones, as you see here in the front, that are basically mechanical constructs and used to fight the wars for the Asterians. We then have the Forge Fathers. Forge Fathers are uh, heavily armored. In fact, they are responsible for building the armor of the Enforcers. Uh, they are, while they are, are very technologically advanced, they do still have a very stratified society. So these models here in the middle are actually the Brockers, which come from the lower class of the Forge Fathers. And so you have lots of very heavily armored units, but mixed with a lot of li uh, light or no armor units. Um, uh, of basically the underclass being pushed into the fight. Next we have the Marauders. Uh, Marauders technically make up a part of the Galactic Co-Prosperity Sphere. Uh, they are space orcs, uh, but they're not your typical, you know, stupid space orcs that are just a swarm faction. Um, they specialize in commandos, uh, you know, still very brutish like you would find from an orc army, but, uh, you know, but still, you know, good at shooting, good at, at exercising their tactics, things like that. So a nice twist on the, uh, on the faction. We then have the plague. The plague represent the general bad guy of dead zone uh, basically it could be a genetic disease a mutation um, you know it's never defined specifically what the plague are um, only that it infects people and you know uh, turns them into uh, not quite an undead army but you know definitely not an army that you you know don't want to wash your hands with afterwards. Um, the The quality of the units range from the stage one uh, bad guy or big bad here in the middle, uh, all the way down to the uh, the stage Z or zombie um, type models, and you have varying levels of effectiveness, you know, between them. So uh, definitely a very uh, you know, melee focused army because they're not very good at shooting. Uh, we then have the Nameless, uh, a Cthuloid type army. Uh, you know, a lot of sea creature looking type units. Um, yeah, heavy, heavy armor, but uh, definitely a very different faction. We then have the rebels, basically those who've chosen to not align themselves with the Galactic Co-Prosperity Sphere. Uh, this is actually one of my favorite factions, not necessarily for you know its effectiveness or or tactical ability, but because it allows Mantic to to be a bit flexible. They don't have to have you know every single model, some variant on the same race. It's yeah, you know, if they come up with a cool alien design, well, Rebs are a great place to put it in because it won't be out of place. But they do have humans and um, you know other other races that you would see around uh, as part of the faction, so that's pretty neat too. We then have the Veermen, so space rats. Uh, lots of you know. Swarm models backed up with lots of, you know, heavy hitters in the background. 
And then finally, we have the GCPS Marines. Uh, they are a human faction, but much lighter armor. And, uh, you know, it's similar to, you know, along the lines of like Starship Troopers, uh, the movie, not the book. Um, you know, but, you know, still good soldiers, but, you know, just your average guys, not not the elites. Uh, there is another faction, uh, is the Maison Labs. I uh, didn't grab a picture for that one because the Maison Labs is actually, uh, it. its core is a human faction, which then actually will take, you know, big bad models from the various other factions. Uh, you know, put those in as... Um, as contained, you know, units that, that they've been experimenting on and are now using, uh, as, as part of their, their fighting forces. So some of the things that I like about dead zone, number one, it's smaller games. Uh, games will typically play in under an hour. Uh, the rules are not overly complicated. Um, you know, it, it's it's pretty easy to get into a game, have some fun. Uh, you know, in addition, the game is very actively supported by Mantic Games. Uh, I know they announced a couple of weeks ago some new models that are coming out for the game. So every year they've had new releases. Uh, not as many as you would see from some other companies, but Mantic does have a lot of irons in the fire. So, you know... From a smaller company, it's nice to see that it's still, you know, actively supported and they're not just moving on to the next game. Uh, the factions definitely do not feel duplicated. You know, I'm not going to play the same game uh, versus uh, a Veerman player that I would versus an Enforcer player versus, you know, an Asterian player. Um, every faction, you know, has its strengths, has its weaknesses, um, and and is going to be a... a a different experience to play against. Uh, I do also like that there are only two human factions. There, are, there's the GCPS Marines, and uh, and the Enforcers. And while technically, yes, you could include Maison Labs, the fact that it does pull from uh, the fact that it does pull from you know all the different factions for some of its its big units. Um, I think definitely or. I think definitely doesn't necessarily put it in as a human faction uh, as the other two do. Um, in addition, the core rules are, are have have remained mostly unchanged. Like I said, errata and fixes um, through the other books. Um, but you know, if you grab the core rule book, you'll still have plenty of plenty of options to get into the game and have some fun with it. One of the best parts about Dead Zone is the community behind it. Uh, I've been able to see that community at Adepticon and Gen Con and other conventions around uh, the country. And for the most part, the people that get into Z Dead Zone, uh, it's been very rare to find somebody that, that I can't just sit down and talk about the game with um, or you know, just whatever. It's a really, really good community around the game. And then the other thing that I do like is uh, the fact that uh, there's a very low barrier to entry in the game. Um, the factions for the starter sets will run you about $40 uh, and give you a good mix of models that uh, are actually more than you would need for an average game of Dead Zone. So you don't have to uh, you know, spend $100 just to get started in the game. Uh, you know, you've got a very low cost flexibility with, with what you can play with, but then you also have very easy ways to expand if you want to get into games like Firefight or Warpath that do have a higher model count and still keep that cost very low. A couple of things that I don't like about the game. Number one, it is more difficult to find, uh, opponents for the game. Um, the, the fact that it's not... A games workshop game and the fact that you know 
they games workshop is the 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 big player in the market it does make it a bit difficult to get into but i think that is offset by the fact that it does have a very low barrier to entry so if you are one that likes trying new games and getting other other friends to try new games i think it it's definitely one that you can do without a without a great deal of pain uh, another thing that i dislike um is the fact that the cube system can be very rigid uh, because you you want to keep it easy to check your range, to check your movement. Uh, you know, typically your terrain is going to fit into cubes, and so you're going to be building it as a cube. And so the structures that you have on the on the play mat are going to be very cubical. Um, not a great word, but it fits. Um, but I do, uh, I do think that I'd like to experiment with playing some games uh, with terrain that isn't as easy to measure, but still, uh, still would look good and still be easy enough to play with. Um, but give it some extra variety in how the tables look. Um, Another problem is that sometimes the rules are not always as well defined. Uh, the uh, The core book is around a hundred pages, and most of that is taken up by unit stats. So your rules, while they do their best to um, while they do their best to to answer all of the questions, provide diagrams, um, it can be it can be, you know, a bit problematic at times. Uh, the expansion books definitely do their best to try to fix that, try to explain rules or reword rules that have been uh, problems in the past. But even with that, the rules are still pretty solid and pretty easy to work with. So uh, I, I don't think that's necessarily a problem. Um and then the other thing is that sometimes you just want a little bit more out of the game. Uh, the fact that its rules are pretty lightweight, the fact that they um, they don't get very complicated. Sometimes you know you may want a bit more depth out of your game, but in the end, I think that that comes down to personal preference. So in conclusion, I mean to me, the game is fun. It's uh, it's a it's a nice game. It's been one of my favorites over the last uh, I th think about seven years since the first edition came out. Um, second edition vastly improved over the first edition game. Uh, it made the game much more lethal and fast. Uh, like I said, each game on average is going to play in under an hour. Uh, and in the end, I would absolutely recommend Dead Zone if you'd like to give a give a try at miniatures wargaming. Um, as I said, with its low barrier to entry and the fact that uh, you know it it tries to keep the rules fast and playable, I really think it's a, a game worth checking out. So. Uh, All right, 